Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Andy Linehan, president of the City Club of Portland. Welcome to our Friday Forum and a program on the new book, 100 Little Hitlers by Eleanor Langer. Before we begin, I've got uh, announcements as usual. The first two relate to our presentation today, but I've got quite a few, so please bear with me. Uh, City Club is putting together a book club on the topic of this book, 100 Little Hitlers. There are sign-up uh, lists at your tables, or you can sign up at the back table, or if you'd like further information, talk to City Club staff. Uh, the Oregon Council for the, for the Humanities, with support, support from Literary Arts, Inc., is also presenting a public forum related to this book. That will be on November 11th, 2003. It will be held at the First Congregational Church at, uh, on Southwest Park at 7.30 p.m. It will be open to the public and free of charge. The forum will consist of a panel of four community members uh, or community leaders moderated by Oregon Council for the Humanities Executive Director Christopher Zinn. Next Friday, September 19th, please join us to hear uh, State Superintendent for Public Instruction, Susan Castillo, speaking on the state of Oregon schools. Uh, Superintendent Castillo will address some of the issues associated with school funding, spending, and administrative structure. The New Leaders Council, or, uh, the arts and culture cell of the New Leaders Council, uh, invites all to join them in attending the Portland Design Festival events, which uh, will be occurring next, sem uh, next Wednesday, September 17th. Uh, the cell is organizing a guided group tour of the festival's main exhibit, which is called the Design Genome. Uh, that exhibit showcases the works of Portland designers in architecture, fashion, graphics, interior design, and product design. The exhibit will be at the Pacific Northwest College of Art, and the tour starts at 5.30. And then following the tour, the cell will go over to the uh, Portland Art Museum Sunken Ballroom and sit in on the Sustainable Standouts panel discussion at 6.30 p.m., which will feature folks from Bora Architects, Wyden and Kennedy, and Nike. For more information or to reserve a spot, uh, contact Nikki at the club office. On Tuesday, October 7th, City Club brings back an old tradition, the new members reception. Join us at City Club offices uh, from 4 to 6 p.m. on the 7th for food, drink, and a chance to meet uh, City Club staff and board members and new members. Uh, members from research programming and issue committees will, uh, will be available to introduce these aspects of, club, of the club involvement and staff will be on hand to answer questions. It's a great opportunity to meet uh, other members, both new and current members, and just have a good time. Although this is uh, something to honor new members, all members are welcome. So please just uh, contact the office uh, or talk to Colin after our meeting today to uh, make a reservation to participate. The Affordable Housing Advocacy Group of City Club is providing packets of postcards for people to send to city commissioners and the mayor, urging additional sources of funding for affordable housing. This is part of a citywide effort and follows recommendations of the City Club's Affordable Housing Report, which was issued last year. These packets are available at the back table um, here at the hall. We're now a week into City Club's annual fund drive. You've heard from me more than a couple times, I think, about the importance of our annual fund drive. Today, Corlene Kraft, who as president-elect is chairing the fund drive, will tell us more about it. Thanks, Corlene. Thank you, Andy. <clears throat> Hello, good afternoon. Have any of you ever thought what Portland would be like without City Club? We've been around a long time, but we are stretched. We have an excellent staff, highly skilled, a new executive director, and as you have just heard, we're reaching out with more and more new kinds of programs because we are an active and activist kind of organization. If any of you read Andy's comments, well, let me just say, those of you who read Andy's comments in the bulletin recognize that we are on a pretty slim string when it comes to funding this organization. And I'll give you a brief behind the scenes look at the budget. We get about two thirds of our revenue from um, membership. And our membership is smaller than it used to be because in the good old golden days of corporate headquarters here, it was de rigueur for many of those organizations to have their members become, mem or their uh, employees become members here. So we've lost uh, some membership due to the corporate headquarters leaving, not to mention the dollars that those uh, corporations gave to us. 10% um, of our funding comes from the portfolio that we have been generously dipping into. Unfortunately, our portfolios are getting lower, just as each of ours in the room are, but we've had to tap into that, and we're doing our diligent best not to go into that too deeply. 
And approximately a third of our revenue comes from the annual fund, and that's what we're here about today. I think there's a misperception in the community that we are a wealthy organization because we have had the names for so many years, but it's not the case. And many people throughout the state who have the opportunity to learn and enjoy our programs are radio listeners, but radio doesn't pick up until the speaker begins, so they don't really understand, if they're not members, exactly what, how, how to contribute to us, and we think that they would like to. Um, but think for a minute what would happen if City Club went away. Well, that is just ridiculous, and it's not going to, because we have new programs, we have new energy, we have a brilliant high energy executive director, and I know there are many organizations that are worthwhile that vie for your dollars, but City Club is unique. City Club doesn't serve a special interest, but serves a general civic interest. Where else can you be engaged in civil discourse about civic interest? Members have the opportunity to work on various committees that they have, that Andy has mentioned today, to work together on committees studying all these, all these issues. And where else do you have the opportunity to interact with world-class speakers, such as we often have on this podium, other than at Friday forums at the new leaders events? Where else? can you get in-depth, objective, and influential research reports, such as the tax study, certainly the com community policing study that was released recently, and we're working on studies on school funding and uh, PUD. Where else is this forum, this platform wanted by leaders from the governor, mayor, city council, county officials, legislators, and uh, Metro, and all, all of the leaders of this state and community seek this platform when they want to make an impression, or when they want to, excuse me, when they want to let our audience know what is going on. And where else do you get no squirm political debates? Because we don't let the po political opponents who are on this platform get out of it without answering the questions. We require that they answer our questions. Where else do you get ballot measure studies to learn about the issues? And where else can you associate with interested and interesting people who are actively engaged in civic issues and who are the stars at every social event they attend because they know so much? Well, no place else but City Club. So cash, checks, money orders, we're happy to see them all. I hope that there will be a flurry of activity reaching for the envelopes in the middle of your tables. And don't forget credit cards. You can put the entire amount on the credit card or you can put small monthly incremental amounts, which is a lot easier for many people. We're happy to see $5, $50, 500 and up. So members, friends, and guests, please take an envelope from the table and help us meet our goal this year of $115,000. We're well on the way. We have about $30,000 already and we've just begun. Thank you. Thank you, Coraline. Just a couple more uh, notices and we'll get, get on to our speaker. I'd like to particularly welcome the members of the Lincoln High School Constitution team who are here in the middle of the room. Uh, they are here uh, with the sponsorship of the Stoll Reeves Law Firm, and we look forward to seeing you all this year, and we thank Stoll Reeves for helping sponsor you. Um, we also have some new members today, and I hope uh, we could have them stand up and we'll give them a round of applause. Uh, William Joyce. Welcome. Rachel Tillman McClarence. And finally, and I've, I've got to read my writing here, Kenneth and Leslie Sentner. There we go. Welcome to the club. Broadcast of City Club programs this quarter is made possible by corporate underwriting from Washington Mutual and Portland, Portland General Electric. We're grateful for their support. Our speaker today, Eleanor Langer, is the author of the acclaimed biography of Josephine Herbst. She has written for the New York Review of Books, the New York Times Book Reviews, and The Nation, among many other publications. The book she'll speak about today, A Hundred Little Hitlers, was chosen as a finalist for the J. Anthony Lucas Award for Work in Progress. Eleanor, Eleanor Langer lives in Portland and, and has taught writing at Reed College, as well as at The Attic and many other locations. And I'd just also like to note that she's chosen City Club to kick off sort of the public event surrounding her book, and we're honored that she's chosen City Club. Welcome, Eleanor.
Thank you. Um, I'm the one who is honored to be standing in front of you at the City Club today um, to begin what I hope can be a useful public discussion of some of the implications for Portland of 100 Little Hitlers. Now, I'd like to thank everyone who had a hand in arranging it, the um, officers and staff of the City Club and a former president, my friend Harriet Watson. Um, this is my first public appearance in connection with the book, um, and I'm just thrilled that it's here. Um, at the same time, I want to make it clear um, at the outset that I do not consider myself an authority on racism, either in Portland or elsewhere. I mean, in an effort to understand the context of the Syrah case, and with considerable help uh, from Daryl Milner of Portland State and several others, I put together the kind of thumbnail history of Oregon racism I'm going to be drawing on today. But one does not really learn about racism from books. One learns about racism from living within it, from having it directed at one, from being black. Um, the people who really know about racism in Portland are for the most part not in this room today. In the next half hour, I want to try to do two things. Um, to bring to life something of the depth of Oregon's racial history, including the racist skinhead movement that arose here in the 1980s, and to show how the relocation of racism from above to underground in the changed world of black-white relationships that emerged from the civil rights movement contributed to the peculiar consensus around the Syrah case that the Portland skinheads and later California neo-Nazi Tom Metzger were the only racists around. My remarks are adapted from different sections of my book. And so um, in reading it, if you do, if you find things sounding familiar, uh, they will be. Um, I also want to say that the book, you know, like so many other things these days, uh, contains material that might um, indeed ought to be offensive to all listeners. Um, I'm sorry if I offend. The premise of 100 Little Hitlers is obviously that we need to look at these things. To people accustomed to the racial politics of larger American cities, the city of Portland is likely to seem uncommonly placid, if only because its black population is so small. There were exactly 54 blacks in the entire Oregon Territory in 1850. And in the city itself, where most came to live, there were approximately 500 blacks in 1900, 2,000 in 1940, 22,000 in 1970, and still only about 34,000 in 1990, the census closest to the death of Mulligata Syrah. At the time of that killing, Portland was probably the whitest big city in the United States. Even with its growing Asian, Hispanic, and Native American populations, about 85% of its 1990 population, which was 371,000, was white. The 2000 census puts the white percentage of a population now at about 529,000 um, at 78%. The secret of Portland, which continues to be well kept, even from the people who live here, is that the racial politics and the smallness of the black population are one and the same. As Daryl Milner, who again is the real authority on the experience of black people in this state, once put it, it is not that black people didn't like rain. Okay. If the Portland skinheads were looking for ancestors who shared their values, they did not have to look as far away as Germany. The history of Oregon would do very well. Admitted to statehood in 1859, a year of intense polarization between North and South over the issue of slavery, the Oregon Territory was infused with racial consciousness, or not to put too fine a point on it, white supremacy from the beginning. The little discussed fact of Oregon history that is responsible for the racial pattern of the state today is that from 1857 to 1926, when it was amended, the Oregon State Constitution not only excluded slavery, it excluded blacks. 
Three other states, Illinois, Indiana, and Iowa, also excluded blacks, but Oregon was the only state admitted to the union with an exclusion clause in its constitution. In fact, the exclusions preceded the constitution. While the 1843 uh, organic law of the state provisional government prohibited only slaves, the constitution of the Oregon Emigration Society of Iowa the same year prohibited any black or mulatto person, slave or free, from joining a wagon train. And an amendment the next year provided that um, any free black who arrived anyway depart within a specified time or, quote, receive upon his or her bare back not less than 20 nor more than 39 stripes, lashes, such stripes to be inflicted every six months until the interloper got the idea. What is striking about the racial debates that occupied Oregon's formative years, besides the similarity of their language to the white supremacist language we hear today, is the sheer disinclination on the part of even the anti-slavery forces to live among blacks. Indeed, the high-mindedness of the anti-slavery forces is so tainted by fear of association with blacks, it is hard to pry them apart. This quote, making Oregon a free state is the best and only means of securing it to the white race, the founding convention of the state Republican Party declared in 1857. According to the National Secretary of the American Anti-Slavery Society, it was not moral principle but selfish policy that dictated the outcome of the slavery debate in Oregon. The attempt to control the presence of blacks did not end with statehood. While the North and South fought over slavery, politicians began creating the white-dominated social order that would later be known as Jim Crow. Blacks wouldn't pay a poll tax, 1862. They could not serve on juries, 1863. There would be no intermarriage, 1866. With white supremacist attitudes reflected not only in the state's official policies, but also in such paramilitary bodies as a Knights of the Golden Circle, which wanted to create an independent Pacific Coast Republic based on slaves, why any blacks who were free to go elsewhere would come to Oregon, and why any blacks who were free to leave stayed, are real questions, but a few hundred did. Concentrated in what is now downtown Portland, Side by side with the equally despised Chinese, they lived within a nexus of understood rules well captured in a 1905 newspaper, newspaper editorial reporting, uh, supporting a theater's right to refuse to sell a seat to a black man. Quote, it is not a question of whether a white man objects to sitting next to a black man. It is simply a well-known fact that he does object. White labor only, white trade only, and even flatly, no people of undesirable colors or kinds uh, were the rules of the day. Excluded from the commercial growth that preoccupied the new town, blacks lived in a world apart. Venturing, venturing out for such work as boot blacking, stable cleaning, house boying, or other menial service to whites, Returning when the day was done to a kind of Bantu stand that in time came to support a variety of institutions of its own, newspapers, restaurants, barbershops, and so on. Whatever stability was achieved in the years before World War I, however, was swept away in its nativist aftermath. In the early 1920s, the state was more or less taken over by the Ku Klux Klan, whose opposition to another three case, this is the way they wrote it, Coons, Kikes, and Catholics, reflected the post-war mood. The Klan sweep was in fact, excuse me, more anti-Catholic than anti-black, but the blacks got the message. Between an increase in violence and a decrease in even the meager job and housing opportunities there were, black people's interest in Portland uh, remained markedly low. Where the black population of every other major city um, in the Western United States grew substantially in the decade between 1920 and 1930, the black population of Portland grew by exactly three from 1931 to, uh, no, I'm sorry, from 1556 to 1559. The white population in that same period grew by 44,000. Um, in 1940, 
after the Depression had further displaced blacks for the sake of whites, uh, the number of blacks in Portland was still only 1,931, which was an increase of 375 people in 20 years. From the numbers alone, there can be no doubt that word had gone out from the first generations of black people to live in Portland. Portland is a good place to be out of. Excuse me. The next phase of the history is better known. Uh, World War II, the shipyards, the rise of the black, pop black population to about 25,000, the housing segregation and job and union discrimination that accompanied it, and ultimately the still shocking 1948 Vanport flood, <coughs> which let, left thousands of black people homeless. It was in this post-war period when contrary both to the intentions of its founders and the will of its citizens, Oregon had become an interracial society that the City Club itself started to take notice. Uh, publishing a series of reports in uh, 1945, 1957, 1968, and 1991 uh, that seemed to be the most accurate mirror we have of what was going on between the black and the white communities um, in those decades. The news was never good. By 1950, the, um, the post-war black population, which was now about 10,000, many of that, those 25,000 um, immigrants having left, that population was largely confined to a single square mile east of the Willamette River, known for the 19th century village that had preceded it on the site, Albina, whose population density was six times greater than that of the city as a whole. A year earlier, 1949, a Fair Employment Practices Act uh, in the state had marked the beginning of the construction of a legal framework within which the advancement of black people could theoretically take place, but popular attitudes lagged behind. A 1950 uh, Public Accommodations Act passed by the city council was defeated in a referendum at the polls. Of even more consequence to the black community than its legal status was its physical status, which was repeatedly threatened. Whatever life it made for itself around the edges of the white community was not allowed to develop. Three times the black community was displaced by the forces of urban renewal. In 1955 for the building of the Memorial Coliseum, in the early 1960s for the construction of Interstate 5, and in the later 1960s for a planned expansion of Emanuel Hospital, some of which has not even yet taken place. In addition to a total of close to 1,000 homes, the black community lost many of the landmark churches, cafes, businesses, medical offices, and other significant black-owned gathering places that had helped give the neighborhood life. And the people had nowhere to go. In spite of the formal rescission of the Portland Realty Board doctrine that, quote, Negroes depress property values, the 1957 City Club report found that more than 90% of the brokers in town would not sell or rent to black people other than in Albina. This is a quote from the City Club report. In confining a majority of its Negroes to a restricted section of the city, Portland has forced them to live in ancient, unhealthy, and wholly inadequate dwellings. Overcrowding, below average living conditions, and the generally lower economic level of Negroes have conspired to produce disquieting symptoms of social disorganization." End of quote. In other words, the racism that created the ghetto in the first place soon made it worse. As the 1950s turned into the 1960s, blacks in Portland, like blacks elsewhere, changed. And the next phase can be summarized in three words, civil rights movement. Breakthrough events such as the Supreme Court's outlawing of segregated schools in Topeka, Kansas, put the restrictions of life in Portland in a new light, and the Montgomery bus boycott a year later showed that for the first time that you did not have to be a lawyer to fight back. Along with the Urban League, which had joined the NAACP as the voice of the black community after World War II, there were now Muslims, Panthers, Corps, and other more radical people and organizations ready to take their demands into the streets. 
Compared with West Coast cities such as Los Angeles and Oakland, which were in the vanguard of black militants throughout the decade, Portland was still a backwater, but it was on the map. The focus of black activism in Portland in the 1960s and 70s was the schools, and for good reason. Almost three quarters of the city's 4,800 black students were enrolled in nine out of 94 elementary schools, whose quality can best be deduced from the fact that despite the large increase in the city's black population since before the war, the number of blacks entering college had actually gone down. The 1980 success of the militant new Black United Front enforcing the ouster of a white school superintendent identified with an unpopular school desegregation plan and his replacement by a strong black former military officer who became the highest paid public official in the state of Oregon marked an important change in the tenor of race relations in Portland. There was more than just a power shift, there was an ideological one. Blacks were not so interested in integration anymore. They wanted justice. Whites were puzzled and lost. The evolution toward self-determination on the political agenda of Portland's blacks brought with it a level of black-white tension never before present in the city. Even among whites who had stood with the blacks in the early stages of the civil rights movement, there was a new sense of distance. As every social and political institution was inspected for racism, none was found more wanting than the police force, which was 94% white. In 1981, as long-standing complaints by blacks about police brutality and harassment grew more insistent, a group of officers from the North Precinct threw some possums on the steps of a black-owned restaurant in the heart of the black ghetto, an event whose semiotics were lost on nobody. In 1985 came the chokehold killing of a black security guard named Lloyd Stevenson, who happened to be a customer at a convenience store where the police were investigating a shoplifting. A, shoplifting. a killing compounded by the fact that when the police chief banned the hold, two officers produced and sold t-shirts with the slogan, don't choke them, smoke them, in their precinct parking lot in the police athletic club on the day of Stevenson's funeral. Both these events brought hundreds of black people into the streets. And six months later, when the t-shirt officers were reinstated in a binding arbitration, which had also happened in the possum case, outrage erupted again. Nor was it only the black community that was outraged. However many aspects of racism blacks believed whites would never understand, homicide was no longer among them. An increasingly liberal and cosmopolitan city establishment, itself influenced by the civil rights movement, believed the police were out of control. I came back feeling very good from lunch. Now I feel like going home sick, said Bud Clark when he had to announce the arbitrator's decision. Other officials were just as appalled. The aftermath of Stevenson's killing revealed just how tender relations between white people and black people in the city of Portland had become but it also marks an important moment. Racism had lost its official status. It had not, however, disappeared. The story of the rise of a full-blown Nazi-inspired racist movement in the Portland youth scene in the 1980s is not a story I can tell adequately today nor is the full story of the, judicial, of the evolution of the judicial proceedings, which produced a gap between the historical and the legal records that I personally continue to find disturbing. It's taken me many years and many pages to tell these interrelated stories in my book, and to me, their truth is in the details. There are, however, a few bedrock facts it is important to note of which probably the most significant is that the skinhead movement developed in precisely the years at which we have just arrived, between the death of Lloyd Stevenson in 1985 and the death of Mulugeta Sarah in 1988. Nationally, a period when the backlash against the civil rights movement was gaining momentum, when the income of young white males was sinking fast, 
and when the white supremacist movement as a whole was experiencing significant growth. And in Portland, a period of the flourishing of the Black United Front, a period which placed most of the burden of social change on the shoulders of young school children, and a period of police behavior which made it clear to the young people of the city that its elders did not really speak with one voice. What is just as noteworthy as the emergence of this movement in the first place is the public reaction to it. There wasn't any. Between the carving of the first swastika on the streets of Northwest Portland, probably 1984, and the burst of skinhead activity that continued into 1989, racist skinheads organized into many gangs, both urban and suburban, and probably num numbering conservatively uh, several hundred, um, engaged in a great deal of overt activity, of which a few of the high points were a murder at Satyricon in 1986, a show of force of 20 or 30 skinheads marching toward a downtown club where they were allegedly going to attack black pimps, also in 1986, a 1988 attack on a man from Singapore as he was leaving a downtown restaurant uh, with his white wife and daughter, and another 1988 attack um, on a black security guard who almost died at the downtown Safeway. There were also numerous individual incidents, a synagogue trashing, an outcropping of racist and anti-Semitic harassment, fights erupting mainly within the skinhead world itself, but sometimes between whites and blacks, an escalating racist presence which led the police intelligence officer who was monitoring it to tell his bosses two months before the Syrah killing that with all of that drinking and violence, it was only a matter of time before someone died. How much the explanation of what we might politely call Portland's avoidance of the skinhead question in the years before the death of Mulugeta Syrah owes to the historical resonance of the skinhead's racism and how much to the racial tensions of the particular moment is not a question that can be readily answered. But with the death of Mulugeta Syrah, the skinheads could no longer be ignored. Partly because of the stature and authority of a range of black community organizations and representatives, including both the Black United Front and Mulugeta Syrah's eloquent uncle, Engada Burhanu, and partly because of what seemed to be the nature of the crime, the death of Mulugeta Syrah engulfed white Portland with a terrible guilt. The past had become the present, which must not be allowed to happen. The problem is that there was, in fact, a problem. Contrary to what has been the general understanding of the killing from the start, the death of Mulugeta Syrah was not the result of a hunting party of skinheads out looking for a black man. It grew out of an unplanned confrontation between a carload of drunk skinheads and a carload of drunk Ethiopians and was determined, if that is even the right word, only a second before it happened. The fact that it was represented differently is also an unplanned occurrence. A black man was dead. The police and the press talked right away with two very distraught Ethiopian survivors who said they were set upon unprovoked uh, by skinheads with bats. The killers were skinheads, and they did have a single bat. Um, the bat, the person wielding the bat uh, was a skinhead nicknamed Ken Death. Uh, it all fit. The, I don't know whose phone that is. I have someone turn off their cell phone. Someone's screen. I don't know where it is. Hmm. Nobody's claiming responsibility for the, for the cell phone. Well, that works. Okay. Um, uh, the facts seem to fit. The myth of the Syrah case practically authored itself. A myth is something that never was and always will be, someone close to the case uh, said to me in 1989. And so it has been. Between the recognition on the part of the district attorney's office that the killing was not in fact the lynching it was made to seem, the intervention of a federal justice department itself under pressure to respond to racial crimes, and the behind the scenes role of a private civil rights organization that stood to benefit from the outcome, the case ended in plea bargains rather than a criminal trial, and the facts of the killing never came out. 
which is not to say it would have been easy to defend the skinheads in a trial. As someone who sat through the preliminary hearings, I can say from my own experience that, does nobody know who, who that is? All right, we'll ignore it. Um, um, Sorry. Um, I don't mean to be saying that it would have been easy to defend the skinheads in a, in a criminal trial. Um, you know, I sat in those preliminary hearings myself, and I can say from my own experience that every attempt on the part of their attorneys to describe the case as other than the hunting party of skinheads that people believed it to be, uh, was met with uh, was met with disbelief. When the skinheads sat at the defense table one day, snacking on salted peanuts, as the Oregonian reported of Ken Miskey, it was as if Satan himself was pouring the salt, and that was the atmosphere in the courtroom. The point is, and this is the um, aspect of these events I want to emphasize here today. The hunting party was just what people here wanted to believe. It was so unambiguous. Understanding the act as even more evil than it was made possible a more complete dissociation. We, that is white people, might go right along as we have always done, ghettoizing black people, snubbing black people, underpaying them, depriving them of a really equal education, but we don't kill them. They, the skinheads, killed them. Looked at from an historical perspective, what sociologists call the moral panic that swept Portland after the death of Mulligata Seurat, the sense that our values were being threatened by a pack of wrongdoers with whom the rest of us had nothing in common, um, that, that sense is practically ridiculous. And I include myself among those so panicked at the time. Racism is un-Oregonian, said one politician at one of the major public post sura rallies. But racism is not un-Oregonian. It is central to Oregon history. A man has been killed because of his race, said another. But black men have always been killed because of their race. It is a big part of their experience in this country. Our country is built on no division between the races, said a third leader. Where did that person go to school? Okay. Let's hope it was not in Portland. The self-exoneration of the city that began with the misrepresentation of the Seurat killing did not end there. It came to include a larger issue. Building on the racial motivation plea uh, obtained by the Justice Department, the Southern Poverty Law Center produced and directed a powerful $12.5 million civil drama in which a killing rooted in Portland history, in the Portland youth scene, and in Portland families all across the socioeconomic spectrum became seen as the work of a California neo-Nazi who had never been in Portland, did not know either the Portland skinheads or Mulligata Seurat, and whose alleged agent, the means through whom the SPLC lawyers dodged the First Amendment issues implicit in their lawsuit, was a smooth-talking but weak-minded California skinhead whose loyalty shifted according to who was paying the most attention to him at the time, and who the Portland skinheads, from the first time they met him, had viewed with distrust. This transfer of responsibility upward from the homegrown racists who actually killed Mulligata Seurat to a national neo-Nazi leader whose primary mode of operations is propaganda is not a trivial matter. Racism is a vital issue in our society, but it is not the only issue. In 1990, it was the good integrationist against the bad racist, but with a simultaneous rise of liberal social activism and right-wing wealth and foundations, including legal foundations, another time it could be another way around. Political freedom also matters. So does the legal system. When Mulligata Seurat and all the other immigrants before and after him come to the United States, it is in part because of a belief that in the American system, unlike in the systems in their own countries, truth will out. That did not happen in this case. I am no more an expert on law than I am on racism. I am simply a writer who started out to cover a criminal trial which never took place 
investigated both the local and the neo-national, uh, the neo and the national neo-Nazi movements at some depth, and then sat in a courtroom not many blocks from here, while the story of a local movement became the story of an outside agitator and decided to tell it in my own way. If a hundred little Hitlers leads anyone, not necessarily to share my views, but to consider the possibility that the stories of the death of Mulligata Seurat and the trial of Tom Metzger may have different meanings than those initially assigned, I would feel that my work was rewarded. Thank you again for the opportunity to talk with you today, and thanks, thanks for listening. <coughs> Oh, those are sobering words. As you know, one benefit of being a club member is that club members can ask questions of our speakers. And in addition, of course, uh, members of the Lincoln High School Constitution class can, are honorary members and can also participate today. Our first question will come from our board host, Heather Kmetz. Uh, she's a tax attorney with Hannah Strader, PC, and serves along with Gwen Milius as co-chair of our new leaders council. Uh, following Heather's question, we'll open the program to club members from the floor. Please go ahead and line up behind the microphones. When your turn comes, uh, please give us your name and, and, and uh, that you're a city club member and ask your question in 30 seconds. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us at City Club today and launching the discussion of um, a, a demonizing event and so much that it might mean to us, both in Oregon and nationally. I was in high school from 1985 to 88 in New York. And I remember seeing skinheads and debating the confrontation of that sort of uh, a person. And whether in fact you should confront them publicly in a, in a prosecution format, or whether it was best to approach quietly and shame them into silence. And I think it was easier then because they were somewhat self-identifying. And I wonder what implications you find today where we have, as lawyers, a new continuing legal education credit on diversity that's supposed to raise racial awareness in Oregon, where we have uh, students who are finding themselves in increasingly diverse communities and not having the tools to communicate appropriately and instead see tensions rising. Is it best to shame them into silence or prosecute publicly? And how might we go about further identifying the pieces of them in us as it becomes less obvious through uh, gang-oriented identification? Needless to say, these are not easy questions. <laughs> Um, the question of prosecution, um, I think, depends partly on the actions that are being prosecuted and the laws under which they're being prosecuted. Um, I can't see myself much of an argument for not prosecuting, you know, overt acts that have taken place, you know, as the acts that they are. Um, but whether how much that extends to uh, to random public con confrontations, you know, if you if you meet people on the street, should you if you meet skinheads or which you're not actually as apt to do today because they've um, withdrawn in a certain way, um, would you start arguing with them there? Well, probably not. Uh, this would probably not be a very good idea. Um, but I think. Within, within Heather's question, there's, or related to Heather's question, there's something that's been debated for years, um, uh, certainly in Jewish organizations and, in a, and perhaps in others, which is should you give these people any publicity that's, let's say, alerting the world to what's going on, or should you, um, or should you ignore them and sort of hope that they'll go away? And in the, in the late 1950s, when George Lincoln Rockwell, a really powerful and influential uh, neo-Nazi leader first emerged. There was great debate in the, um, American, uh, in the American Jewish community about 
what to do when they had decided on a, on a quarantine policy. They just weren't gonna mention him in the press. Uh, but it didn't hold. I mean, he started having very controversial demonstrations in the, in, in the mall in Washington and other places, and uh, he soon got around it and got, and got his publicity. Um, the other part of your question? How do we, how do we, boy, these are good questions. I, um, I, I don't, I don't really know the answer to that. I'd say, I'd say everybody has to look into herself or himself. You have to try to see things, things through other people's eyes. I guess make a real effort to see things through other people's eyes and maybe remember Remember that you don't get it unless it's directed at you. Um, it seems, whether it's racism, anti-Semitism, whatever it is, it just, it seems like, it seems like words on paper until, until you actually feel it. Um, try empathy, I, I don't know, try, try. I, you know, I, I don't know, just keep alert. It's a hard, it's a hard question. Uh, Nikki Lynch, member, um, I really appreciate sort of having that his, to history timeline, I mean, it, it makes, you, you tend to sort of forget, and of course I didn't grow up here, but mm -hmm. uh, I, I am aware of that history. But I feel like when you got to the point where you're describing uh, the trial or the pre-trial, uh, I would be interested in sort of like a little more filling in the details of how that transition took place from the trial, the, from trying these, the boys, that were involved in having Metzger be the, you know, what was the sort of detailed evolution of that? It was it was a series of steps uh, that began with the plea bargain, the racial motivation plea bargain engineered by the Justice Department. And as as paradoxical as it will sound um, and seemed at the time, the skinheads, uh, the three skinheads involved in the killing, did not want to plead guilty to racial motivation because. They claimed that it was not a racially motivated crime. People can debate endlessly whether it's possible for racist skinheads to commit a non-racially motivated crime, but they said that it was a, a drunken accident. They had no intention of killing Seurat or anybody, and uh, they, didn't, they didn't want to do it. They were proud of their racism, but they were not proud of the killing. Um, but under this enormous federal pressure, uh, with some behind the scenes um, work from Morris Dees, they did plead guilty to racial motivation. The link was that in order to hold somebody else, i.e. Tom Metzger, responsible for the killing, it had to be shown to be a racist killing. So the racial motivation part of the plea bargain was, was absolutely indispensable to what came later. Um, I, I guess I should add one, one more point there. Um, in order to avoid the free speech implications, the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center used this character named Dave Mazzella, um, claiming that Tom Metzger had sent him to Portland as his agent to organize the Portland skinheads. In fact, these Portland skinheads had organized themselves uh, several years before and had committed acts, including that Safeway incident that I mentioned um, only two months before in which the man almost died um, they did not need Tom Metz. They did not need Tom Metzger or Tom, uh, Tom Metzger's alleged agent um, to be in the flare-up situation that um, produced the killing. I'm sorry, I think I think you were Corlean Craft Carleen. member. I can remember walking along the park blocks where a lot of the skinheads used to congregate and mm -hmm. just going to the museum and being afraid. I remember another time walking with a friend of color one evening past uh, Pioneer Courthouse Square mm -hmm. and being afraid. But I don't see them around much anymore. And I'm wondering what you have found. Have they sort of gone underground or gone away in Portland? What about in the country? And I know that they're quite visible in Europe. So what, what have you found about that? Um, the nature of the movement has changed somewhat, um, and it's part because of the internet. This, uh, you know, the book that I wrote, this story of the Sirach killing is set largely in, it's set almost entirely in the 1980s. It's hard to remember, but it's pre-internet period. So 
it's easier for them to communicate without being, um, you know, without being on the streets. Um, there is in Portland a, um, I guess it's a, it's you'd call it still an underculture, but it it's based on the white power music business, which earns a tremendous amount of money for neo-Nazi groups um, here and abroad. Portland, these groups, um, these bands, it's called Intimidation One after, you'd be interested to know the um, language of the Hate Crime Act, which was passed shortly after uh, Sarah's death. Um, the band is called Intimidation One, the group itself is called Volksfront. They are linked much more extensively to uh, the European neo-Nazis than um, the members of Eastside White Pride were because the members of Eastside White Pride were writing letters by hand to organizations in Europe and uh, elsewhere in the country. So the, the character of it has changed. It appears to have grown enormously more sophisticated um, but less visible. Leslie Moorhead, City Club member. Um, do you think that the actual outcome of the legal case, which was I think the large fine on Tom Metzger and shutting down his organization was a good thing? Is that at least that did happen and what are the ramifications of that? I think that the Southern Poverty Law Center's case against Tom Metzger uh, had remarkably little influence on either Tom Metzger or the uh, national white supremacist movement. It, it had a, a lot of personal short-term ramifications for Tom Metzger in that he did lose his house and um, some other business operations that he had. More important to him personally was that his wife, a woman who he had been married to for 28 years, mother of his six kids, died uh, in the same period that his house was being repossessed. Um, what happened, I think, I th the neo-Nazi movement, what, you know, waxes and wanes. It, it changes. A different leader is on top at one time or another, and different patterns are on top at one time or another. But Tom and, and Tom Metzger is now, you know, in his 60s instead of in his 50s. And this and this the particular group that he was trying to attract is not on the streets anymore. He's still an enormously inf influential figure. Um, both because of his historical contributions, which include uh, a lot of these technological innovations and an ideological innovation, which is this kind of left-right fusion uh, because, he's, because he's an economic, social and economic radical as well as a racist. Tom Metzger is, is, lands on his feet, and right this minute, a BBC crew is in um, Fallbrook, California, filming a documentary on Tom Metzger that is going to be shown to 10 million people in Europe. He lands on his feet. He's just, that's how he is. He's irrepressible. So, I don't know who's, who's next. Do you? Okay. I'm Craig Hill. I'm from Lincoln High School, attending today as a guest member. Mm -hmm. I was intrigued by what you said on Oregon's history of racism because that's not really taught in schools or at least around here because it's more the focus on making everyone feel comfortable and mm -hmm. not really trying to offend anyone. And although it may offend people, I think it's very important to be taught in schools. I'd like to hear your thoughts on if you think it should be taught in school, and if so, at what level? Absolutely. I would think it would need to be written into the curriculum, you know, from the earliest social studies um, classes for elementary school students. How else are people going to be able to understand it? It is uncomfortable, but that's, that's how, it, how it was. Uh, my name is Jeremy Marquise. I'm also from Lincoln High School. Um, <clears throat> you talked a lot about uh, the history of racism and anti-Semitism, etc. What do you think is the uh, future, or what do you think now is the amount of racism? Is it, is it more? Is it less? What do you think? I think that um, the degree of overt expression of those things depends a great deal on other conditions um, in the country at any given time. I think there's, there's kind of a, of a race, so to speak, between, on the one hand, the real nature of the changing population of this, of this country and the, this tremendous intermingling of populations in the world. That's, that's going on on the one hand. And the, on the other hand, we have this, uh, you know, as we know here all too well, um, 
dangerously dwindling economic base, you know, social pressures of many kinds, and it's that 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 the um, that the leaders of the white supremacist movement um, thrive on. They're, I mean, they're hoping that things will get so bad that uh, that there will eventually be a. I mean, in the most extreme form, they hope that there'll be a, a separation of the races, you know, a division of the country. They really will hope that the country will fall apart. And, you know, the, I have no prognostications on that, obviously, but the, the um, it's better if you have a strong economy, people have jobs, people have houses, you know, people are being properly educated. All those, those are your bulwarks against, um, against division occurring. Hi, I'm uh, Adam Van Lund, I'm a club member. Um, in your history, you mentioned a lot of statistics uh, of numbers, particularly population figures. And uh, uh, you know, from my own experience, uh, statistics on subcultures are notoriously unreliable. And I'm wondering where you got those numbers and if you looked into uh, or fact-checked them, compensated, I'm just you mean you, you mean the Black population as a subculture? Is that what you're? Where yeah. Are these figures well, I, I mean, uh, statistics from? on minorities can be very unreliable, uh, and I wondered where I, you got I, your numbers from. I can't really speak to those there, to, to that. They certainly came from a variety of um, books on, you know, Western racial history, on, um, you know, things that were in, re in Oregon history journals that you can find at the um, Historical Society and so on. I'd have to. Um, I can't off the top of my head tell you this number came from here, this number came from where, but just what you would think would be the normal sources for uh, that kind of historical research. And whether they were accurate at the time, I, I, I don't know, but I've certainly never seen anything contradicting them. Seems, is there one in, anything in particular that seemed no. off? No. I, I was just curious about your uh, statistical analysis for those things. It wasn't, it wasn't my statistical analysis, it was my taking figures that uh, I found from the work of historians. Thanks. Okay. Rachel Tillman McLaren, new member. There are a lot of questions, of course, that come to my mind, and I'm sure other people's in here, but one of the things that seems most poignant in this kind of discussion is how much during your discovery process did people in positions of authority, be it social, uh, legislative and legal take any kind of responsibility or or even acknowledge the role that our political and social leaders have in this kind of continued racism that that I think everybody in this room recognizes still exists today and did you discover in your research any venues within any of those groups that people could um, participate in and actually take some action to up-level the, um, the awareness of these things. One example that my husband and I discovered was um, during his process as a, being s solicited for a jury, he discovered language in the pamphlets that are given to jurors that refer to masters and slaves. And he wrote, he wrote a letter to the legislature and to the, to the mayor and others asking why this was still in our public documents and if that could be changed or if it should be changed I, it, the, the question is open should it be should it but it's it's certainly something that's still there was there any acknowledgement of the responsibility that these leaders take in this kind of behavior um, let me just refer that back to, to Heather's questions that that was the kind of question that she was asking at the beginning of um, what you know how can we be more alert to um, to what to what's going on and that's a perfect example. You know, if you get something that says masters and slaves, yes, say something about it. Yeah. Okay, that's the kind of confrontation um, that you that you want to have. Um, perhaps, um, you know, perhaps the uh, the city club is the right forum to begin to find a range of venues where this can be explored. Um, one of the one of the things I, I noticed is very striking, and you'll see if you if if you read my book, you see the, the discussion of um, school integration. Um, how little guidance the children who were actually 
the ones doing the integrating got in those. I mean, they really were thrown into new situations with just a kind of naive, I mean, maybe you could say it's, it's sweet, but it is certainly naive, um, assumption that everything was going to be fine. You know, we made these changes in, in who, you know, who was going to school where. Great, the kids will all just overnight adapt. But in fact, there were problems in the schools. Um, there were difficulties that kids encountered. I did not see um, evidence of people understanding that at the time. Maybe now it's a little bit more obvious and people can begin to respond. We've just about run out of time. I think we have time for one more short question. <laughs> I don't know who was right. first. Ken Lewis is my name. I'm a City Club member. I found your talk extremely educational and obviously something that none of us were fully aware of, like the student before who said that this isn't taught in the Oregon history books. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering what suggestions you might have to further disseminate the kinds of things that you found out, obviously, through the media, through the newspapers, through the TV. I mean, do you have any suggestions how to get the story out even more than it has been? Well. You know, I think the schools are so important because it's every year or so, or every two years, there is an article in the Oregonian or somewhere that, that recapitulates some of this history. But, but do they get it right, or do they say it's not us, it's them? Well, not that part of it. That never is gotten right. But the, at least the facts about the exclusion clause in the Constitution and so forth, that, that comes up every so often. But you know, it's an article in the Oregonian, it disappears. And then the next year, there's another article that says, y yes, the there exclusion the clause wasn't amended until 1926. So I can't think of anything other than you know, sort of long-term programs that, that will, will actually change the understanding of, of kids going through the school system, and hopefully their parents who are helping them with their homework, um, of, what, of what the reality really was and how it relates to the present reality. Well, your book was certainly a service to those of us who are here. Thank you very much. Well, I hope so. Thank you. Thank you all. The City Club is adjourned. Thank you.